his party brother's orchestra. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Joining us now in our studio are three of the activists who broke into the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, on March 8, 1971. The break-in led to revelations about the FBI's secret COINTELPRO program that targeted activists across the country. None of the burglars were ever caught. On Tuesday, their identities were revealed for the very first time. Keith Forsyth, Bonnie Raines, and John Raines all lived in Philadelphia in 1971. Forsyth was working as a cab driver. He was chosen to pick the lock at the FBI office. Bonnie and John Raines hosted many of the planning meetings for the burglaries at their home, where they were raising three children. Bonnie, who worked as a daycare director, helped case the FBI office by posing as a college student interested in becoming an FBI agent. John Raines was a veteran of the Freedom Rides movement and a professor at Temple University. He used a Xerox machine at the school to photocopy many of the stolen documents. We're also joined by Betty Metzger, author of the new book, The Burglary, The Discovery of J. Edgar Hoover's Secret FBI. Metzger first reported on the stolen documents while working at The Washington Post. She uncovered the identities of most of the burglars in her new book. And we welcome you all to Democracy Now! Keith, I want to begin with you. Um, talk about the time and how you ended up going into the FBI office. What spurred you on? So, at that time, uh, we had just within a few years going through uh, the sort of peak of the civil rights movement um, and many of the laws like the Voting Rights Act had been passed some years before but the reality of uh, racial justice was still far from complete. Um, there were uh, the war in Vietnam was raging at that point in time um, and so there were many, many people uh, who were working for change in those areas in particular. Um, my main focus at that time was the anti-war movement. Um, I was, you know, uh, spending as much time as I could uh, with uh, uh, organizing against the war, but I had become very frustrated with uh, legal protest uh, didn't seem to be getting us anywhere. The government wasn't listening. Uh, the war was escalating and not de-escalating. Um, and I think what really pushed me over the edge was um, shortly after the invasion of Cambodia, uh, there were four students killed at Kent State and two more killed at, uh, at Jackson State. And I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't think I'd have this down after all these years. Uh, and uh, that really pushed me over the edge. That it, it was it was time to do more than just uh, than just protest, than just march with a sign. Uh, and I um, uh, joined uh, the so-called Catholic Left, uh, which is where I met John and Bonnie, and also Bill Davinon. Uh, and from there, uh, the next step was was the uh, uh, was the media action. Uh Keith, could you also talk about how you were invited uh, to join this plan to break in to by uh, William Davidon? Uh, if memory serves, he called me on the phone and, and asked. Explain who William Davidon was. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Bill Davidon uh, at that time was a professor of physics at Haverford College, uh, and I knew him mainly as uh, a fellow activist in the peace movement. He was very prominent in Philadelphia, um, in both the legal and the illegal peace movements. Um, and he um, uh, he called me on the phone uh, one day and asked me if I wanted to come to a party, which was code for an action. And I believe I said, um, uh, sure, I'm always up for a party. You can check the FBI transcript because they were tapping his phone at the time. Um, and so we met at an outdoor location where we couldn't be um, uh, bugged, and he presented the idea to me then. And Bonnie Rains, talk about your involvement. What motivated you? You were a young mother of three. How old were your children? Uh, they were eight, six, and two at that time. Um, we've since had a fourth child. Uh, I became involved, um, as, as Keith said, uh, beginning with the Civil Rights Movement. 
and when we lived in New York and were students. Uh, then we moved to Philadelphia, very much opposed to the war in Vietnam, and found a whole community of activists in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> we became acquainted with the um, what was called the Catholic Left at that time, um, and the Berrigan brothers, Phil and Dam, were, were the leaders in that. Uh, and we participated in a, with that group called the East Coast Conspiracy to Save Lives in a draft board raid. We went into a draft board in the middle of the night as part of the draft resistance movement. Where was that? In North Philadelphia, a draft board in North Philadelphia. We targeted that draft board because it was in one of the poorest sections of the city where they were bringing many, many, many young, poor young men into the, <coughs> into the armed forces to be sent as cannon fodder to Vietnam. Uh, our government was lying to us about the casualties both civilian and military casualties. So I participated, along with John, in, in uh, going into a draft board and removing files and destroying those files so those young men could not be drafted. And you mentioned the Berrigan <coughs> brothers, the yes, priests, yes. Uh, Phil, uh, the late Phil Berrigan mm -hmm. um, and Father Dan Berrigan, yes. who's still alive. Um, Catonsville, how significant in 1969 was this for you? I wanted to go to a clip right now mm -hmm. um, of the Catonsville action. That was Catonsville, Maryland, where um, a group of activists led by Fathers Dan and Phil Berrigan uh, burned draft cards with naked. Palm. Uh, they stole hundreds of draft records and torched them. They were sentenced to three years in prison, their action helping ignite a wave of direct actions against the draft in the Vietnam War. We do not believe that nonviolence is dead, and that we don't believe in interposing one form of violence for another, and that we believe that an action like this will still speak to our fellow Americans and bring home to them that a decent society is still possible, but it's, it's totally impossible if these files and what they represent are preserved and honored and even defended as those poor women tried to. That was Father Dan Berrigan as they stood around uh, in a circle and burned with napalm, a napalm being yes. used in Vietnam, draft records. Mm -hmm. That was a very dramatic moment for all of us, I believe. <clears throat> um, it took civil disobedience to another level and uh, really brought us clearly to an another level of protest against the war in Vietnam. And uh, we followed their lead in targeting the draft as one of the real evil systems of that war. Uh, and that's how we became involved in covert <coughs> Uh, actions with draft boards in Philadelphia. And John, John Raines, can you talk about um, your sense that the anti-war movement itself had been infiltrated by FBI informants? Oh, sure. I mean, th that was obvious uh, for any of us who were uh, involved in the civil rights movement, because it happened in the civil rights movement. J. Edgar Hoover's FBI was all over the civil rights movement with infiltrators. Uh, and uh, uh, surveillance, uh, intense surveillance, uh, and uh, and people that would report back on meetings and so on. And of course, we'd all know that J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI went after Martin Luther King, tried to uh, discredit him, indeed even sent him a note suggesting that because of his activities uh, with other women besides his wife, he now had no option but to commit suicide. That note was sent to Dr. King, suggesting, and it was from the FBI, suggesting that Dr. King commit suicide. Uh, so that we knew from the Civil Rights Act uh, uh, actions that J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI were very much against anything that, that promised significant social change. We brought that information, that knowledge, north with us when we came uh, to the, uh, the anti-war movement. Uh, and uh, it became clear that the, the tactics he used to disrupt and, and destroy, try to destroy the protest movement in the South, uh, he was using once again against uh, the protesters against the war in Vietnam. Uh, the problem was, uh, Jagger Hoover was untouchable. Uh, he was a national icon. I mean, he had presidents who were afraid of, of, of him. Uh, the people that we had elected to oversee J. Edgar Hoover's FBI uh, were either enamored of him 
or terrified of him. Uh, nobody was holding him accountable. And that meant that somebody had to get objective evidence of what his FBI was doing. And that led us to the idea that Bill Davidon uh, suggested to us. Let's break into an FBI office, get their files, and get what they're doing in their own handwriting. You and Bill Davidon are professors. Yes. Uh, he, a professor at Haverford, you a professor at Temple University. Yes. What did you feel about the risk that you were taking? Were well, you concerned yeah, yeah. about getting caught? Well, Bonnie and I uh, were parents, uh, and uh, we had three kids uh, under 10. Uh, and, and that was a very serious uh, consideration. Um, we had to be persuaded that uh, we could get away with this. Uh, and uh, we learned nice burglar skills from uh, priests and nuns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> and, uh, and we'd cased uh, the FBI office and media very carefully. You uh, thought about Philadelphia, but thought it was too secure. Oh, yes. It was a big building downtown. You couldn't touch that. But media, you could. Uh, and uh, we felt quite confident that if we could get in there, and get out without leaving any physical evidence behind, that we could then disappear into the very, very large uh, anti-war movement, uh, thousands of people in the Philadelphia area. You had prepared in case you were caught to have your children taken care of. We had. We had. Uh, we, knew the, we knew the risks. We knew the jeopardy. We weren't going to be reckless. We weren't going to move ahead with our involvement, except with the leadership of Bill Davidon, who we all had so much admiration and respect for. Um, but we did feel that it was necessary to speak to John's older brother and his wife and to my mother and father about caring for our children if should the worst happen and we would be convicted and sent to federal prison. Keith Forsyth, you chose the night of the Muhammad Ali, um, Joe Frazier fight. Mm -hmm to break in. Why? Why was this so significant, March 8th, 1971? Well, it was just, you know, there were many steps that we took to try to avoid getting caught. Um, and this was one of them, uh, because uh, whoever suggested it, and I have no idea who it was, uh, thought that it would add to the distraction, not only of the police, but of just uh, people in general. Uh, the building in which the office was located had, had a live-in supervisor, and his apartment was directly below the FBI office. So um, he was going to be on the next floor down while we were inside walking around opening cabinets. Um, so uh, anything that could keep his mind off of the ambient sound sounded like a good idea. How did you know that you would find what documents you would find, or did you know? We didn't know. We, we were, we were pretty sure. Um, uh, you know, bureaucracies are the same everywhere. They love to keep records. Um, but we really, we were taking a shot. Uh, so in that sense, we we got lucky that they did keep records. This brings Betty Metzger into the story, um, whose book this week, *The Burglary*, reveals the identities of. Um, the activists involved in this burglary. Um, looks like J. Edgar, Mover, J. Edgar Hoover uh, found his match in this group of people. Um, talk about receiving in the mail the documents. You're a reporter at the time for The Washington Post. <coughs> okay. I'd just like to say something about Bill Davidon, if I might, first, that um, the idea was Bill's. And um, Bill participated in preparations for the book and the, and the documentary that's been made in 1971. And we should note that uh, we're all very sorry that Bill's not with us. Bill died in, in November. Uh, but he was a, sort of a genius in coming up with, with this idea because, um, although many people in the various movements at that time thought that there was uh, there were an FBI informers in their organizations, there was no evidence of that, and the public <coughs> didn't know. And Bill had this deep commitment that if the public could be presented with evidence, they would be very upset 
even though there, he, Hoover was an iconic figure, that if they knew that, that there was massive surveillance of the political surveillance, that they would care and do something, and that's what happened. Um, I was a reporter, and one day this uh, envelope appeared in my mailbox, and uh, it said it was from Liberty Publications. That was the return address, Media Pennsylvania. That didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> Um, but when I opened it, uh, there was a cover letter that said it was from the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. That was a new organization to me. <laughs> and uh, there was the letter explained that a group of eight people had burglarized an FBI office on the night of March 8th, and that enclosed were some of the files that they had removed from the office. And some of those files were very shocking. Um, I think the, the one, and you showed the excerpt from this on the retro report, the first shock, uh, and this also resonated very much with the public when it was published and discussed, was the one that uh, instructed agents to enhance the paranoia and then also um, make people think that there's an FBI agent behind every mailbox. And that was a pretty stunning statement and said so much. And the, the burglars were themselves were shocked, I understand, when they found that, the first, saw that document the first night uh, after the burglary. So that stunned me. And I guess the other files, there were, there were many about individuals, and they were all serious. But the, one of the things that I remember most from those files was the, the truly blanket surveillance of African-American people that was described. It was in Philadelphia, but it also prescribed national programs. It was quite stunning. First, it described the surveillance. It took place in every place where people would gather, churches, classrooms, stores down the street, just everything. But it also specifically prescribed that every FBI agent was supposed to have an informer just for the purpose of coming back every two weeks and talking to them about what they had observed about black Americans. And in Washington, D.C. at the time, that was six informers for every FBI agent informing on black Americans. The surveillance was so enormous that it led various people, rather sedate people in editorial offices and uh, in Congress, to compare it to the Stasi, the dreaded secret police of East Germany. Could you talk about how the editors at the Washington Post responded when you showed them these documents? The editors responded very positively to them. I, I should point out that um, two things. First, this was the first time that a journalist had ever received secret government documents from a source who had st from the outside, an outside source who had stolen the documents. So that <laughs> tended to pose a, a different kind of consideration as to what you would do, in their minds, uh, as to what you do with the documents. But it was a particularly tough decision for Catherine Graham, who until this time had never faced anything like this. The publisher. The publisher. Catherine Graham, the publisher of the, of the Washington Post. Uh, because it was the first time that she had been faced with a demand from the Nixon administration that she suppress a story. And she did not want to publish. And the in-house counsel, the lawyers, also did not want to publish. But two editors from the beginning realized it was a very important story and pushed it, Ben Bradley and, and Ben Bagdikian. Uh, I was just back there innocently writing my story, talking. I'd been a reporter in Philadelphia and was talking to sources from the past, uh, confirming information. Uh, didn't know until 6 o'clock that there was a question as to whether or not they would publish. By 10 o'clock that night, she decided to publish. And talk about the reaction and the reporters who <clears throat> did not get to publish the story, because you weren't the only person um, that uh, these activists sent the documents to. 
They sent them to five people. Uh, to, these, these are the first files that, were, that they released. They sent them to uh, Senator George McGovern and Representative Perrin uh, Mitchell from, from Baltimore. And they uh, immediately returned the files to uh, the FBI when they received them and didn't make them public. They sent them to three journalists, uh, in addition to, to sending them to me. Uh, they sent them to Jack Nelson at the uh, Washington Bureau of the Los, at Los Angeles Times. A great crusading reporter who wrote Terror in the Night about the Klan in the South. Right. And Tom Wicker, columnist then at the New York Times. Now, it's also important to keep in mind, in addition to the fact that we didn't really know, the public didn't know what was happening inside the FBI, that very few journalists ever wrote investigative work or critical comment about the FBI. And Jack Nelson and Tom Wicker were two of about three or four who had up and up until that point. At the L.A. Times, uh, Jack never received the envelope, even though it was addressed to him, and it was uh, delivered to the FBI immediately. I didn't know this until years later, when I read the investigative report on uh, the, the FBI's investigation. It's a little less clear what happened at the Times as to whether Tom Wicker received him. What, ha what they did do was the same thing. They immediately gave the files to the FBI, and but they apparently kept them and copied them, unlike the L.A. Times, uh, because the day after we broke the story, then they wrote stories on the same files. Keith, uh, before we go to break, um, can you talk about parallels to today? It is hard to look at. And for a moment, I want to turn to the Church Committee hearings uh, that took place a few years later. Um, Senator Frank Church of Idaho uh, uh, led this investigation. The Senate's Church Committee investigated the CIA and FBI's misuse of power at home and abroad. The multi-year investigation in the mid-'70s followed the exposure of COINTELPRO, which stands for Counterintelligence Program. And it was the first time people had seen that word was in the documents you released. Um, Examining the FBI and CIA's efforts to infiltrate and disrupt leftist organizations, the CIA's attempts to assassinate foreign leaders, and much more. This is Senator Frank Church speaking during one of the committee's hearings. We have seen today the dark side of those activities, where many Americans who were not even suspected of crime uh, were not only spied upon but they were harassed, they were discredited, and at times endangered. That was Senator Frank Church. The Church Committee hearings led to major um, uh, uh, changes in what the FBI could do, and also dealing with uh, the press as well. You listen to Frank Church, you could be hearing possible hearings today, though they haven't started, to do with Edward Snowden. Right. What are your thoughts on Edward Snowden today? I, I think there are some parallels. It's not an exact parallel. But to me, one of the most significant ones is that not long before Edward Snowden released these documents, James Clapper went in front of Congress and the American public and was asked a direct question whether the NSA was engaged in this kind of surveillance, and he said no. Um, which was obviously a lie. Uh, and <clears throat> I think if he had said, oh, we can't talk about that because that's national security, I might have had some respect for that answer. But to come out and lie to the public about it um, and, of course, not suffer any punishment as a result. Um, so to me, Edward Snowden, I've seen no evidence personally that Edward Snowden has released anything that was actually harmful to our national security. Um, you know, it certainly has been embarrassing. Uh, uh, but to me, the the uh, young man is a, is definitely a whistleblower, and has performed a great service by enabling us to have the conversation. You know, we couldn't we couldn't have the conversation about whether this is right or wrong before because we were not told about it. So he's made that conversation possible, and I think I think we owe him some a debt for that. We're going to break and come back to this conversation. Our guests are Keith Forsyth and Bonnie and John Raines. They were part of the what they called themselves the Citizens Commission to Investigate the FBI, activists during the Vietnam War era who broke into an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania. 
and took the documents they got and sent them to The Washington Post and other publications to let people know what the FBI was doing. We're also joined by the woman who has revealed the names of these activists, and we'll talk about why they decided to come forward, um, Betty Metzger, former Washington Post reporter, author of The Burglary, The Discovery of J. Edgar Hoover's Secret FBI. Stay with us. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global grassroots news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org today. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.